Hello everyone and welcome to the Disability and Jesus Sunday service for today, Palm Sunday, the 28th of March, as we enter into what the Church calls Holy Week, the week leading up to the events of Maundy Thursday, Good Friday and Easter Day itself. Palm Sunday always strikes me as a day which is about, in so many ways, subversion. Jesus comes to subvert people's expectations of what Messiah would mean and to subvert the hold that the cult of the temple had on the people, not the cult of the worship of God per se, but the cult of making that into a business enterprise and of holding people in thrall to it. So Jesus comes to shake up what people think about God, about his worship, about his Messiah and about themselves and to lead us forward into a new understanding, into a new relationship and ultimately as we reach Easter Day into new life. So let's join together today apart but together still and worship God in the midst of that new relationship, that new opportunity and that new challenge to our thinking. Our prayers of penitence and confession. There are words in bold on the screen that I encourage you to join with me in saying when we get to those parts. First words of introduction. The Spirit of the Lord fills the world and knows our every word and deed. Let us then be open and honest and confess our sins in penitence and faith. Most merciful God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we confess that we have sinned in thought, word and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us to amend what we are and direct what we shall be, that we may do justly. Love, mercy, and walk humbly with you, our God. Amen. And now hear these words of forgiveness and release. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon us. Pardon and deliver us from all our sins. Confirm and strengthen us in all goodness and keep us in life eternal, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray. True and humble King, hailed by the crowd as Messiah, grant us the faith to know you and love you, that we may be found beside you on the way of the cross, which is the path of glory. Amen. The reading is taken from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 11, reading verses 1 to 11. When they were approaching Jerusalem at Bethpage and Bethany, near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? You just say, the Lord needs it and we'll send it back here immediately. They went away and they found a colt tied to a door outside in the street. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said, what are you doing untying that colt? They told them what Jesus had said and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed behind were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. 
then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. This is the word of the Lord. Imagine yourself in or near Jerusalem on the morning of that day which would come to be known as Palm Sunday. If it was AD 33, as we think it was, then it was the 29th of March, or at least the day that we would call the 29th of March. So it's very much about this time of year, it's about this moment that we live through today. As the sun rose early in the morning, so did Jesus and his disciples readying themselves, preparing themselves for what was to come during that day and during that week, which Jesus, of course, had far more of an idea about than did his disciples. They left the place where they were staying, the home of Mary, Martha and Lazarus in Bethany, just a couple of miles away from Jerusalem, and they headed up over the ridge of the Mount of Olives and towards the holy city. On the way, Jesus sent his disciples to acquire the donkey, which he'd no doubt prearranged he would need, and Jesus approached Jerusalem, ready to enter it, riding on the donkey, fully aware of what the symbolism of that meant, and fully aware that people would know what the symbolism meant. After all, the prophet Zechariah had said very clearly that the Messiah would come riding on a donkey. And so Jesus and his disciples carry on their way, heading for Jerusalem, heading for the temple, ready with this symbolism to meet the people. And of course it was the temple which was their destination, the temple which was the symbol of Jewish identity par excellence in the very pluralistic and cosmopolitan world of the first century. The temple which was a magnet for pilgrims from across the known world, the seat and the source of power for the Jewish authorities, the temple which attracted vast numbers of people and vast amounts of money through the temple tax, payable by all Jews wherever they lived, and payable by pilgrims in their spending and in their offerings, and payable on tithes and land owned by the temple. The temple was a huge business enterprise, as well as a centre of worship. And Jesus approaches, riding this donkey, down from the Mount of Olives, across the Kidron Valley, up the slope, and through the Golden Gate, the gate known by everyone to be the way, the manner, the route by which Messiah would enter Jerusalem. It's not just the symbolism of the donkey and the entrance through the Golden Gate, it's also the timing that's important and crucial. Jesus enters Jerusalem on this day, the beginning of the Feast of Passover, the beginning of a festival week. It's the busiest pilgrimage week of the whole year. Jerusalem is teeming with not just its usual crowded inhabitants, not just the usual number of visitors, but thousands upon thousands of pilgrims. It's probable that the Kidron Valley through which Jesus rode was full of people in makeshift camps who couldn't find accommodation in the city itself. There's a sea of pilgrims everywhere. They're camped all over the city, all around the city. It must have looked something like Glastonbury or Woodstock. The festival of Passover itself is a festival of liberation from slavery, a festival commemorating the time when the Jews were released from bondage in Egypt to freedom, to their journey to find the promised land and to settle there as God's people, a festival of freedom, 
and so Passover scooped up many people who had a hunger and a desperation for change, for hope, for liberation. And those who longed to see the day when the Holy Land was no longer occupied by the Romans had their energies and their enthusiasm and their excitement at fever pitch in the week of Passover. If God was going to do anything to liberate his people, surely this would be the time he'd choose. And so Jerusalem was a powder keg as well as a place of pilgrimage in this Passover week. So when Jesus arrives, this rabbi whom people have been talking about and wondering about, and since he arrives in such a deliberate and prophetic way, the crowd goes mad. They clearly get the symbolism of Jesus' manner of arrival. They clearly get the messianic message as Jesus' arrival echoes the promises in Zechariah chapter 9 and elsewhere. They're excited by what they see happening. They throw their cloaks on the ground. You only do that for a king. They wave their palm branches. They shout their hosannas to the son of David. You only do that for a messiah. They know who it is they're welcoming. They believe that this is the moment they've longed for. They see this as a triumphal entry, like the triumphal entries that the Romans were so fond of giving their generals after a particularly stunning victory. Jesus here has his triumph before battle is even done. The crowds believe that they're getting what they've wanted for so long. But remember that Jesus' procession entering Jerusalem wasn't the only one entering Jerusalem that day because from the other direction came another procession. Pontius Pilate came in too with a large cohort of soldiers, a big show of military strength. Why? Because they knew what the mood was like in Jerusalem at Passover. They knew what a powder keg it was and so the garrison was brought to ensure peace at the festival. In normal times, there'd only be a few Roman soldiers stationed in Jerusalem. The temple police were the usual peacekeepers. But at Passover, the risks of trouble and rebellion were so much higher. And Pilate came not just to ensure peace at the festival, but also with a little ceremony that reinforced the position that the Romans had over the Jewish nation because Pilate brought with him the ceremonial vestments that the high priest had to wear in the temple. The Romans didn't allow them to remain in the temple all year. It was one of the ways they demonstrated their rule over the province, their domination of the Jewish people. The high priest had to literally go on bended knee. The high priest had to literally go on bended knee and ask the governor for use of these robes. So as Pilate is coming into Jerusalem from Caesarea via Joppa, Jesus is processing in from the Mount of Olives. Jesus' entry in so many ways is a parody of Pilate's, and it deliberately echoes Zechariah's message that military strength will be cut off. So here's Jesus entering as Messiah, but not as a warlike Messiah. Jesus comes to announce the, the ragamuffin regime of the Prince of Peace. Jesus deliberately contrasts the kingdom of worldly power with the kingdom of God. And he forces people to answer the question, whose side are you on? And that surely is the question for us every Palm Sunday and every day. Which procession do we follow? Do we follow the procession of worldly power with its promises of peace that really is no peace? Or do we follow the procession of the Messiah whose victory will look like defeat? 
whose power is made perfect in weakness, whose wealth is judged not in possessions, but in love and relationship, whose offer of life is not to exploit the things that the world can be made to offer, but to enjoy the peace, the liberty, the wholeness, the shalom of the kingdom of God. Palm Sunday gives us a choice, a choice of who to follow and of what we think we're following. Many in that crowd no doubt thought that Jesus was coming in as a revolutionary leader to repel that procession coming in from the other side of the city, to repel Roman rule. Jesus disappoints them in one way, but fulfills their hopes and their expectations beyond their wildest dreams in others by demonstrating that the limits of our understanding, if we limit our understanding to worldly things, are pitiful by comparison with the wide vistas of God's kingdom. Jesus will go on to visit the temple. Jesus will go on in John's account. Jesus will go on to visit the temple. Jesus will go on to cleanse the temple and rid it of some of the worst excesses of that business model which exploited people and forced them to pay more than they should through exchange rates. Jesus will go on to do all of the many things that we remember him doing during Holy Week. But he'll go on with one destination in mind. He'll go on a journey through the upper room, the Last Supper, the agony in the Garden of Gethsemane, the betrayal, the arrest, the mock trial, the scourging and the privations to reach the cross, the place where he will be lifted up, the place where he will demonstrate not just where the world's systems lead us, but also where the kingdom of God breaks in, the place where he will be seen magnifying God's love as he takes the weight of all that's wrong, as he takes the weight of all that's wrong on himself, in order that he may carry it and us through death and see us rise again with him to new life in the shalom of the kingdom. May we follow, may we follow that Messiah as we enter a spiritual temple with him this week. May we say our hosannas, may we follow him to the cross, that we may follow him to the empty tomb and beyond. Amen. Our prayers of intercessions, praying for ourselves and for the church and for God's world. There is a response. When you hear or see the words, your kingdom come, we reply together, your will be done. So let us pray for the breaking in of God's kingdom in our world. Jesus, you taught us to trust you in all things. We hold to your word and share your plea. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Jesus, where nations budget for war, whilst you say, put up your sword, your kingdom come, your will be done. Jesus, where powerful governments claim their policies are heaven blessed, while scripture states that you bless the powerless. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Jesus, where those who speak up for dignity are treated with scorn or contempt, 
your kingdom come, your will be done. Jesus, where our prayers falter, our faith weakens, our hope fades, your kingdom come, your will be done. Jesus, where we are broken in body, mind and spirit, and wholeness seems far from us, your kingdom come, your will be done. Jesus, you have declared that your kingdom is among us. Open our lives to receive you. Strengthen our hands to serve you. Give courage to our hearts to love you and our neighbour and ourselves. Amen. The Lord's Prayer Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. As we draw our service to a close, once again this week, some words of blessing. Christ crucified draw you to himself, to find in him a sure ground for faith, a firm support for hope, and the assurance of sins forgiven, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, be among you and remain with you this day and always. Amen. Let us then go in peace to love and serve the Lord in the name of Christ. Amen. Mm -hmm.